Deputy Mr. DeCastro and everybody else who wants to stay in the courtroom to surrender their phones. I need Mr. DeCastro to empty all of his pockets. What's that? Yeah, empty your pockets, pockets and give up your phones to the judge. Okay. I have to give you my phones? Yeah. My phones have to be completely off? Yep. Yeah. I don't really want to be part of your YouTube channel. Sorry. You already are. Great. You already are. Awesome. No. I'm not going to get into this guy though. I'll get into someone else. No, no, they're going to go to my marshal. He's, he's a pig. Excuse me? I said he's a pig. Okay. All right. Mr. DeCastro, please stand. I hereby sentence you to 90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count one, 90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count two, to run consecutive for a total of 180 days in custody. <laughs> What's up, you guys? Welcome back to Southern Draw Law. My name is James White, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, former police officer. Now, I have no idea how many of the people who watch my videos are fans of or followers of Chili DeCastro from the YouTube channel Delete Laws, but I suspect that some of you are at least familiar with him. Now, if you're a fan or you follow him, where you at least know who he is, you may know that he's currently incarcerated in the state of Nevada after being found guilty at a bench trial for disorderly conduct and being sentenced by the judge for two consecutive 90-day terms to total 180 days in jail. I want to be clear about a couple things. Number one, I'm no fan of Chili DeCastro. I don't prefer the way he audits. I think he's pretty arrogant, and I think he brings a lot of this on himself. But none of that really matters in the grand scheme of things. What I will say is that I don't believe what he did in Nevada was illegal, and I believe he got a raw deal. One that should have been anticipated, but raw nonetheless. Part of the reason he's currently incarcerated is because of the way that he conducts himself with the police and his inability to read the room when he's in front of a judge who has the power to make his life hell. Now, he seems to have figured this out somewhat as evidenced by one of the recent videos that he posted to his YouTube channel featured here. I went in front of Judge Zimmerman again, and she she had already decided that I wasn't going to give myself on. And, you know, for Ms. Zimmerman, we, what she doesn't understand is that I really have fundamentally changed my perspective. She may not know that because she only sees what she sees on video, you know, how I, the way I am with my bravado. But obviously, after losing in Arizona, losing in Massachusetts, losing, losing in Ohio, and now losing in Nevada, the common denominator there is me. And so when I go to court, I have to change the way I have been, or I'm just going to continue to lose. I'll just continue to lose over and over and over again. So where Ms. Zimmerman was incorrect was that, I, I unfortunately, I've had two weeks of just completely being, you know, in a position like this where I have time to think. And so I have changed, and I want to advise anybody else who ever hears me that you should not behave the way that I have done in court in four different states, and I've lost in four states. So obviously, the problem is me, and so I have to change the way I am. Continuing on that idea, as I move into public life, I have to change the rhetoric that I use because there's a half the people support cops and the other half the people don't trust cops at the least. I, I realize now that I have to change. After losing in four states and four different courts, it's not, what's the common denominator? It's me. And so that means that I'm doing it wrong. And so that's what I want to teach other people. Don't do it like I did. Do it right. Do it. Show the deference and the reverence that you have to show to the court. Even if we don't agree with the system as it is, we still have to live within it. Now, aside for the reasons that he stated in his video, another reason he's incarcerated and the subject of this video is because he has a complete misunderstanding of case law. Specifically, the United States Supreme Court's holding in Houston versus Hill, which was decided in 1987. Chile has long made the assertion in his videos and in his printed materials that he sells to people that Houston v. Hill created a right to interrupt police officers in the course of their duty. The misinterpretation of this case became even more evident to me after my last video where I featured a story where some college students had their rights violated for criticizing the police and I had several people in the comments post that Houston v. Hill was a controlling free speech case and even that any analysis beyond Houston versus Hill was unnecessary. That really is just not correct. 
and I thought I'd take this opportunity to try to clear it up. So with that, y'all buckle up because we're going to go back in time. The year is 1987. It is five years after Raymond Hill was arrested for the fourth time for violating a Houston city ordinance, making it unlawful to interrupt a police officer in the execution of his duties. Hill sues in the federal district court. He loses at district court, and then he appeals and wins at the appellate level, but very narrowly. In fact, he won an in-bank decision that led to the entire appellate level court hearing the case, and he won eight to seven in his favor. And then the city of Houston, of course, appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court agreed to take the matter up, and now we have the opinion we all know as Houston versus Hill. Now, despite what Chile and a bunch of other people might have you believe, this case was really only about free speech as an ancillary matter. The primary purpose of the discussion in this case had to do with the overreach of local and small governments in making their law substantially overbroad such that they could infringe on constitutionally protected activity. In other words, cities and counties create laws that are so broad in their language that they vest the police officer with far too much discretion in the way the law is applied. So the backstory is that Raymond Hill was a gay man who was basically an early version of what we consider now an activist or an auditor. He was a free speech advocate who routinely criticized police. As mentioned, at the time the case was decided, he'd been arrested and acquitted on four different occasions for this municipal ordinance. This serves as a point of distinction. The court in Houston was not deciding whether Hill's speech was constitutionally protected. And that's why Houston versus Hill is not really a free speech case. Hill was actually acquitted of the charges at the trial level for the fourth different time before we ever got here. But he sued because, as Justice Marshall hilariously indicated in the oral arguments, anyone who's read the first few pages of Hill's reply knows that he'll be back. So very much like our friend Chili DeCastro, Hill was somebody who wasn't just going to go away because the cops didn't like him and wanted to keep arresting him. But he asked for four specific things when he sued in federal district court. Number one, he wanted a declaratory judgment that the ordinance was both unconstitutional on its face and unconstitutional as it was applied to him. Now that's important because you can say that something's unconstitutional on its face, but he wanted it to be determined that it was both unconstitutional on its face and for the court to determine that the way it was applied to him and arresting him multiple times was also unconstitutional. So that was the first thing he wanted. The second thing he wanted was a permanent injunction to keep the city of Houston from enforcing the ordinance after the court decided in his favor. The third thing he wanted was an order to have his records of arrest for the ordinance expunged. And the fourth thing he wanted was damages and reasonable attorney's fees. Now at the district court level, Hill lost on every single count. The court found no merit in anything that he was trying to argue. He appealed and eventually, as we mentioned before, the appeals court found in his favor but they didn't give him everything that he wanted. The appeals court found that the ordinance was substantially overbroad, but it disagreed with Hill that the ordinance was unconstitutionally applied to him. So in other words, the court didn't really take an issue with the way that the ordinance was applied to Hill. And by not taking an issue with that, the court did not carve out any of the speech that Hill was arrested for as protected speech. The court also found that Hill didn't provide any evidence that he'd been damaged as a result of the arrest, but it did award him reasonable attorney's so again, he asked for four things. The court said, yeah, it's overbroad, but it wasn't unconstitutionally applied to you. We don't need to give you a permanent injunction, but we have faith that the city of Houston won't go against our order. The court said, we haven't seen any damages as a result of the arrest, but we will give you reasonable attorney's fees. And then there's no note in the Supreme Court record as to whether or not they allowed the expungement. I suspect they probably did, but... I don't know. Now, that. again, after losing the case at the appellate level, the city of Houston appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ultimately took the case and they went through a bunch of discussion about overbroad analysis, and the Supreme Court ultimately just affirmed the decision of the appeals court. Again, significantly, that means that the Supreme Court took no position whatsoever on whether the speech that Hill was arrested for was protected or not, despite what People who say Houston v. Hill was a binding case for free speech would actually have you believe. All the court said about speech was, today's decision reflects the constitutional requirement that in the face of verbal challenges to police action, officers and municipalities must respond with restraint. We are mindful that the preservation of liberty depends in part upon the maintenance of social order, but the First Amendment recognizes, wisely we think, 
that a certain amount of expressive disorder not only is inevitable in a society committed to individual freedom, but must itself be protected if that freedom would survive. We therefore affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals. And again, what was the judgment of the Court of Appeals? Remember, all the Supreme Court has done here is say, yes, we agree, and stamped it with the blessing of the Supreme Court. We have to look at the decision of the Appeals Court to know what the Supreme Court actually agreed with. And again, the Appeals Court said that the ordinance as applied to Hill was not unconstitutional. It said the ordinance on its face was too broad in that it could infringe. But the real issue was that it afforded way too much discretion to police officers in deciding what qualified as interrupting and what didn't. What the Supreme Court seemed to really be concerned about, and you could tell by listening to the oral arguments, which I've linked below, was that Officer Kelly, in his lower court testimony, indicated that he had witnessed violations of the ordinance over a thousand times, but he had only made two arrests on different occasions. Now, the city of Houston tried to spin that as a positive, essentially saying that, you know, Officer Kelly could be trusted and that he made good, sound, reasonable decisions, but what they missed was the opposite of that. They missed the danger, the slippery slope that gets created. What they saw as Officer Kelly using restraint might have been seen by others as Officer Kelly improperly using his discretion to arrest two people because he didn't like what they had to say. Or in the case of Mr. Hill, because he didn't like the fact that he was gay. So whether or not Kelly's discretion was a matter of him showing reasonable restraint, or it was a matter of him weaponizing his discretion as a way to punish people he didn't agree with, we'll never know. But what the court recognized specifically was that when you give police too much discretion in their ability to enforce a law, you take a risk that it will be enforced improperly based on a number of subjective feelings that could manifest as implicit biases within police officers as they do their jobs. And that is the danger of having a law that is substantially overbroad. And that's what almost the entirety of the analysis was by the court. It really had nothing to do with you know, exact phraseology or protected speech. So despite what Chile has sold to thousands of people and apparently convinced himself of, Houston versus Hill did not carve out a right to interrupt a police officer in the course of his or her duties. Instead, Houston stands for the proposition that a city can't define a term like interruption so broadly that its potential application could infringe on conduct that would be considered protected under the First Amendment. And that is a much, much different thing than saying what Hill did was protected free speech. In closing, I just want to say that my intention is not to pick on Chile. I actually think he's a very smart and articulate guy and that he probably could have been a lawyer or a constitutional law scholar had he chosen to go that route. But as someone who has busted my rear end to do the hard work of becoming an attorney and earning multiple graduate degrees, it always offends me when someone claims for themselves a title in the absence of work and education that it actually takes to become that thing. I have nearly 25 years of experience in the law, and I would never refer to myself as a constitutional law scholar or an expert of any kind, actually. You see, I believe that it's other people, the consumers of our work or consumers of the things that we put out into the world who are the actual arbiters of expertise. If someone claims to be an expert in something, they probably aren't. If someone acts like the kind of tough guy that Chili acts like when he's physically challenged police officers, they probably aren't. Real tough guys keep their mouths shut and they let their competence do the talking and only do so when it's unavoidable. And that's why you see Chili in his appeals bond hearing serving consecutive 90s hunched over and shivering in front of the court, throwing himself on the mercy of the judge and begging for an appeal bond that everyone with a pulse other than him knew wasn't going to be granted. And for the record, I think he should have gotten the bond, and I think he should have been released, but it wasn't reasonable for him to expect that to happen under the circumstances after the way he behaved. But even my personal feelings about Chile's lack of authenticity is not the real issue for me. What I find disheartening and truly offensive is that there are people out there who believed him. Even though he's the furthest thing from a constitutional law scholar, he's managed to convince people that the reason he's been able to get by with this for so long is that he's correct. When in actuality, he just 
is an athletic and confident person that managed to intimidate a bunch of police officers or make them decide that he wasn't worth the trouble. And as a result, people have paid him $20 a pop for these misleading legal documents that will inevitably, by the way, if they implement the strategy attached to those documents, put them in the exact same situation that Chile finds himself in today. He admitted in the course of his trial that constitutional law scholar is a moniker that one of his viewers gave him several years ago, insinuating that he has no formal legal training whatsoever, but he chose thereafter to market himself as an expert. He also certified to the court that he makes most of his income from selling what I consider to be very misleading legal documents to people. His inability to understand this case is a perfect example of the difference between a person who is a constitutional law scholar and a person who should have located and listened to a constitutional law scholar instead of convincing themselves of something about themselves that wasn't true. In that way, Chile has become a victim of his own ego, stubbornness, and false sense of identity. And even all that is not enough for me to say that I'm glad that he got what was coming to him. I guess I'm unique, or at least I try to be, in that I try very hard not to allow my personal feelings about who a person is, what their background is, the way they act, or what I think about them personally to cloud my judgment of the facts in a case. I take no joy in the fact that he was unlawfully arrested and improperly convicted. I actually believe he has a good chance of winning on appeal based on the obvious bias of the judge and ironically based on the fact that it was the holding in Houston that forecasted this exact situation. You see, the Houston court did not create a right to interrupt police, but it did warn us about what would happen if officers were given too much discretion in determining that speech which is acceptable and that which is not. Now again, Chile has expressed in the video we watched that he's learned and sees things from a different perspective. If you've watched many of my videos, you know I believe that people show us who they are and it's our job to believe them. But, but I also believe in the incredible power of the human spirit and in our innate ability to change our perspective and change who we are. So for Chile's sake, I hope this transformation is authentic. Regardless of whether you believe him or whether you don't, the entire purpose of the First Amendment is that we must tolerate what someone else has to say, regardless of whether or not we like or agree with them, regardless of whether we find their speech offensive, obnoxious, or difficult to tolerate. They have more of a right to say it than we do to allow our feelings about it to chill the expression of their ideas. That's all for this one, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. Please remember to like and subscribe and leave me a comment on the video. Check out some of the other videos on my channel and leave me a comment there as well. Till I see you again, take care. Always film your interactions with the police and keep your evidence to yourself.